So my name is Richard New. I'm the Vice President of Research for, for Western Digital. It's been a long afternoon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm the last, last presentation here. So um, try to keep you guys awake. Um, we've shown you over the course of the afternoon a uh, variety, you know, we've shown you leadership in products and technologies ranging from gaming to HDD, Helium HDE, um, uh, EPMR, uh, energy assist technology, uh, uh, NAND flash, uh, NVMe over fabrics. And, you know, one, one of the things, if you've been in the storage industry for a while, you realize that, you know, uh, making great products is just, you know, is not the complete end of the story. We have to take those products, we have to work with our customers to integrate them <coughs> into a broader system, right? So that's, that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about how we're uh, driving open standards and open source. So um, typically for our storage products, you know, there was a lot of discussion today about, um, about zone storage. So we have a storage product which is a block-based device. It interfaces with an I.O. interface <coughs> protocol. There's drivers. There's a software stack on top of that from Linux operating system. There's file systems. There's application layers, et cetera. And you know, one of the things that you, that you realize from an architecture perspective is that frequently, you know, in order to make our storage products most effective, we have to be able to work with the ecosystem as a whole to kind of be able to shape that larger software stack and architecture to, to you know, realize the benefits of our storage. So if you step back and look at part of the story that we've been telling today, um, there's a few things going on at a, at a higher level. One is that we have a variety of new storage technologies that are driving the need for new systems architecture. So we talked about zone storage quite a lot. Uh, zone storage requires a redesign of the software uh, stack to some extent. Uh, we talked about NVMe of fabrics. NVMe of fabrics is clearly a technology that is not just about making a device. It's about changing the, the ecosystem and changing the architecture of the overall uh, data center and how it works. We have an increasing diversity of platforms and use cases with unique requirements that we talked about. So everything from machine learning driving unique requirements on storage uh, to IoT to automotive. And there's an increasing expectation that all of these use cases will be optimized for. As people spend more money on storage, uh, every bit of optimization happens. Certainly, every, every bit of optimization <coughs> in the in the you know in the cloud data center, for example, example, there's a expectation of you know TCO optimization that is is greater than we saw 10 years ago, for example. The other constraint that we face is that sometimes architectures are not that flexible, right? We have hardware architectures and software architectures that are not that easy to change. So our strategy in dealing with these larger ecosystems is essentially to, um, to promote and embrace open standards and open source innovation in both software and hardware. And that's one of the things that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to start with this uh, zoned storage initiative that was which touched on before. There were some questions about how that changes the software stack. So I'm going to I'm going to just mention some of the work that we've done in this in this space. Uh, so Swap <coughs> described the the benefits of zone storage, and just to repeat, you know, fundamentally, um, the HDD and the and the NAND device. Have, at some level, they have the same fundamental underlying write constraints. On the HDD side, we changed from the regular PMR storage to SMR storage. We started overlapping the tracks uh, because we could increase the aerial density. And in doing so, we introduced some complexity in the system because obviously it's no, no longer possible to do random writes within a zone. So we had to add an indirection layer, if you like. And that indirection layer, depending on the application, is either added in the software stack or on the device itself. But at some level, you're introducing some indirection into the system. For NAND, if you think about it, NAND always had this constraint. NAND has erase blocks. Within an erase block, you tend to want to write your pages sequentially. So NAND always had this constraint. When NAND was introduced, the way it was, in it was introduced into a world where HDD was the dominant technology, so what they did was they put a flash translation layer on the NAND to make it look like an HDD. So from a, when you look at an SSD uh, today, it has this indirection system on it already. And you can read or write any block arbitrarily. And you don't see what goes on in the, inside the SSD. But the SSD is kind of rearranging. You know, it has this indirection. You, you think you're writing at one LBA, but you know, in reality, it's written somewhere else on the SSD. So that's what the indirection system does in the NAND. 
So when, when SSDs were first introduced, they were so much faster than SSD, than, than HDD, that you know, this flash translation there didn't cause any problems, right? But if you think about it, people are trying to optimize the software stack, so trying to make everything faster, this indirection layer at some point becomes itself a little bit of a bottleneck. And when you think about how the software stack works, if you have an indirection system on the device, as well as indirection systems, let's say in a file system, they're both at some level trying to do the same job. They're both trying to do garbage collection. Uh, they're both managing write amplification, et cetera. So there's a lot of redundancy there. And one of the things that zone storage does is it essentially collapses that redundancy. And this is, this is where the value comes from, for, from zone storage for an SSD. Essentially, it's the thing that allows a customer to uh, control where the data gets placed on the SSD, remove the additional write amplification and garbage collection that happens in this indirection layer. So this is, this is really uh, allowing the customer to extract more value from the device by improving the software stack and the interface. Uh, and then also this unifies the interface for HDD and SSD, providing a common interface that allows you to write to a, co you know, a common software stack to, to make use of both of them. So we made a significant investment in the Linux software stack. Uh, this picture here shows some of the layers. You can kind of maybe get a sense of the complexity and the amount of work that needs to be done to enable this. But there are several different layers that need to be changed in this software stack. There was discussion of the file system. So you know, there are file systems <coughs> that uh, you know, can be, are, have been modified to make them, I'll call it z uh, zone storage aware. And then other file systems that are not zone storage aware but which work on top of uh, like an indirection system or a device mapper layer that exists inside the operating system. So there's several layers of, 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 of work that have been done. So Western Digital, uh, as Swapna mentioned, has led this initiative both in terms of proposing the standards uh, activity within NVMe and also driving the software stack work to enable this. And of course, working with our customers uh, to get them to adopt this technology. And as Swapna mentioned, there's significant pull for this technology because it really allows you to extract value from the device that is, that is not available today with this uh, unoptimized software stack. So um, this is an example of our effort driving open standards and open, uh, open source, open source software in this case. We also have a number of activities uh, in open source hardware. So open source hardware is sort of a new area that you, you, know, you may or may not be familiar with. But of course, as a storage company, we not only work on fundamental storage technologies like you know, uh, magnetic recording or NAND, we also develop our own controllers, for example. And our controllers have, for example, cores in them. And we've announced publicly before, we're shipping roughly a billion cores a year in our own devices because of the number of cores we ship in our controllers. So we have a strong interest in this area from a storage perspective. I'm going to talk very briefly, since it's the end of the day here, I'm going to talk very briefly about, about some of these initiatives. Uh, first of all, we were a founding member of the RISC-V organization. So RISC-V is an open instruction set architecture. And just to explain what that is, if you look at a, at a system uh, on the bottom left here, if you look at a, inside a, a CPU, there's multiple cores inside the CPU. Every core is a little <coughs> engine that runs an instruction set, as, as shown in the top right here. <coughs> a variety of different instruction sets that you can run. There's sort of Intel x86, there's ARM instruction set, power instruction set. So RISC-V is a new or different instruction set that is defined as an open standard. So you don't have to go license the instruction set in order to build a CPU around it. So that's what RISC-V is. Uh, as I say, we were founding members of this group that has now grown to, is basically taking off. Um, a huge number of, of companies uh, driving the ecosystem around RISC-V. Uh, we have created and open sourced our own RISC-V cores that we have made available through this organization, Chips Alliance. So just to explain what the, the difference is between Chips Alliance and RISC-V. So RISC-V is governed by a RISC-V foundation that manages the instruction set architecture. Chips Alliance is an organization that's formed to, to host and provide a collaborative environment for development of open source hardware projects. So for example, the core that we developed, we've developed three cores now, we have open sourced them through this uh, Chips Alliance organization. 
This, uh, this organization is also growing very quickly. Um, there's an announcement today that Intel joined this organization, for example. Whoa. It just came out a few years ago, a few, few hours ago. So um, this is a rapidly growing uh, ecosystem that is built around this open, the principle of open hardware that Western Digital is helping to drive. Can I buy, can I buy a risk? Not me, actually. <coughs> so is <coughs> risk 5 available? You can go to GitHub, you can download a RISC-V core for free that is a fully verified embedded core, and you can use it in your system today. And you would burn it on an FPGA or something like that? or You can run it on FPGA, or you can build an ASIC out of it. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so there is everything ready for production. You mean. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so this uh, is mostly... Uh, produce this a real CPU. So this is just the core. I mean, all the other pieces that make a CPU. Can, can, so I, this can is, I buy this a real CPU? Right, right now, today, tomorrow, yeah, right now today, a, this is mostly in the... build a Raspberry Pi with the risk, Raspberry Pi competitor based on the, risk. There, there is a, a board that exists today that's kind of similar to a Raspberry Pi that, that exists today that you can buy. Uh, but this, you know, RISC-V is a, is, a, is a new industry initiative. Most of the cores available today are what we <coughs> call embedded cores. The cores that we uh, have produced and open source for our, our, you know, we're using them in our, you know, our plan is to use them in our own products. These are embedded cores. There is no, I'll call it like a data center, uh, data center RISC-V uh, CPU, CPU available today. But there are a lot of people working on higher performance RISC-V cores. So, um, I'll mention another open source project. So you may have seen an announcement about this um, a few months ago. Um, one of the projects that we're involved in, this is teaming up with uh, Low Risk and Google and other companies, is this Open Titan project. So Open Titan is the first open source uh, silicon root of trust. So again, from a, you know, security is obviously very important to us as a company. Given how much how much you know data is stored on our devices, uh, we we you know we want to create the best security solutions possible. We believe that the best security solutions will be fundamentally open source uh, solutions, and this follows you know a, a principle, a widely held principle in the security world, where uh, you know open solutions are generally considered to be stronger because open solutions provide the ability for external partner, partners to kind of look at the details and try to break them. So over time, these, these open source solutions provide very robust security. And the goal of this project is to make an open source a hardware silicon root of trust. And so we're participating with Google and a few other companies <coughs> to drive this project. This project happens to be RISC-V based, although that's not really a significant uh, part of it. Uh, mostly it's about creating an open source uh, security platform. Is this an, to compete or to to work alongside things like Nitro from AWS? I mean, is it meant to sort of emulate what they've been doing with their, their hardware sort of direction? Uh, there are many roots of trust out there. Uh, pretty much all of them are proprietary roots of trust. So we're, we're not, you know, the, the, main, the main thrust of this is that, it, you know, it will be open source. It will, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not necessarily intending to, uh, you know, replace a lot of the security systems that are out there. It's, it's intended to provide some kind of open source version of this that over time we believe will or may become an industry standard. Okay, maybe I should rephrase it then. If you look at what, um, say, Amazon have done, they've gone down the hardware route to get, to get better performance, scalability, and, and so on in, in the infrastructure that they deploy and more control of things like this. It, I was just trying to work out whether maybe this is like your on-premises version of it to, you know, to try and change the way <coughs> technology in our own data centers to become more aligned to that sort of methodology and doing it through an open source process. Um, I'm not, we, we may need to talk about this offline. I'm not sure I can answer your question directly. Okay. Um, Let's talk about it. We'll okay. talk about it All right. I'll mention a, a final final project, and this is this is really a, a, a project in very early stages. But this is a project also that's an open source uh, project that we have uh, put out um, on GitHub. This is about we were just talking about uh, memory disaggregation. So this is a memory disaggregation technology. 
Uh, it's called OmniExtend. Essentially what it is is a cache coherency fabric because memory attaches to a cache coherency bus. Um, and it's a cache coherency bu uh, fabric that, that is an open standard and can be extended across any kind of fabric, including Ethernet in this case. So cache coherency is the thing in a system. If you have a system with a bunch of cores, cache coherency <coughs> is the thing that allows all of the cores to see all of the memory as sort of one big address space and to resolve uh, discrepancies that occur when, you know, if you have multiple cores, each core has its own cache and each core is trying to address, you know, access a, a bit of, of information on, on shared memory, you can get sort of um, discrepancies in the cache. You know, if one guy writes to its cache, the other cache is not updated, you have a cache coherency issue. So cache coherency fabric allows you, allows the system to resolve that and therefore allows multiple cores to access uh, memory as a shared pool. So this is a, you know, an open cache coherency memory fabric that would allow you to disaggregate memory. And as we were talking about before, this is, you know, this has a, this has a ways to go. It's not something that is in, in production today, but this is a, an open source effort that we're driving. So that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, we, you know, throughout the, the presentations today, you've seen uh, we're committed to open standards at the device level, obviously. We're driving uh, architectural innovation through promotion of open source hardware and software in various ways. You've seen, uh, we believe that open source software is an enabler for some of the architectural changes that we want to make at the device level. Um, open source hardware, you've seen a number of different projects there. Uh, we believe open source hardware will eventually become as significant to the industry as, let's say, Linux is to the, to the, to the open source software world. And we believe that um, you know, these kind of architectures, these open architectures are the future. And that's why we're, we're driving these things. Our fundamental uh, interest here is to you know, allow our storage devices to be used more effectively at the architectural level. I didn't hear anything about self-encrypting drives or methodology. About which? Said said drives or any innovations in that area? Well, we have <laughs> we, we obviously have uh, self-encrypting drives today, right? Yeah. So we have products that have uh, security implemented. Our security today is not open source, so this is kind of a long term a long term effort to build an open source uh, secure hardware infrastructure. And our goal in the long term is to leverage this in our products. Okay, thank you. <laughs>